During the mid-2000s, the superhero genre was finding a second win as the world of special effects could bring more and more characters to life in ways that we'd never seen before. Spider-Man could finally believably swing through the cavernous streets of New York, the Hulk could transform before our very eyes, and the X-Men were squeaking every time they moved because of the 40 cows worth of leather wrapped around their mutant bodies. But one superhero fell into the middle area between the comic book revering Spider-Man and Hulk films and the partially embarrassed by their source material but still pretty good anyway X-Men and Blade movies. Daredevil. I've always found this movie an interesting paradox because it's sort of all over the place. It wants to be serious at times, but it also seems to be completely stupid and silly on purpose. It wants to do a respectful adaptation of the source material in some ways, but also tramples on other parts of it for some kind of cool factor that doesn't really stick the landing. That light? The end of the tunnel? That's not heaven. That's the sea train! It's a first real attempt to capture the street-level world of Marvel superheroes. Spider-Man's kind of street-level, but he's also kind of Avengers-level. Daredevil's all about the grim and gritty underworld of buzzsaw glove-wearing criminals and stilt-based crime. And in Daredevil 2003's bombastic attempt to bring the man without fear to the big screen, they also spawned an even weirder spin-off movie that I don't see anyone talk about. Daredevil seems to be an easy punching bag for movie fans when they're talking about how superhero movies have a shaky start before the MCU took off. But I want to take a real look at what does and doesn't work with this one through the eyes of, well, the radar sense, of a big fan of the comics it's based on. Was Daredevil 2003 really that bad? Electra sure was. But first, a word from our sponsor. Special thanks to Raycon for sponsoring this video. Raycon is on a mission to prove that you shouldn't have to pay an arm and a leg for quality sound and essential smart tech listening features. It's a no BS product. You can get a pair and a spare and still pay less than you would with some of those other more big name tech brands out there. When I'm editing videos, I need crisp and clear sound to balance audio. And sometimes I just like to listen to music while reading comics. Normally I find earbuds cause me discomfort, but Raycon earbuds use custom gel tips for the perfect, most comfortable in-ear fit and have 8 hours of playtime for everyday earbuds. I also love the easy use touch controls that give 3 different sound profiles for whatever you need. If you want high quality earbuds for a good price and an easy way to help support my channel, click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com forward slash Godzilla Mendoza to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Now back to the video. Daredevil's plot focuses on the secretly superpowered disabled lawyer, Matt Murdock, as he attempts to battle the criminal forces in Hell's Kitchen, New York by day through the legal system and by night as a crazy ninja man dressed like Satan. We see his origin story where his father was taken from him by crime boss Hector Salamanca. Cabron, I need to see you a boss. After he was splashed in the face by TCRI ooze. That stuff is spaceship fuel. As an adult, he finds romance with Electra, the daughter of a billionaire who is assassinated by the city's kingpin of crime, and he has to clear his name when he's framed for the murder by a hitman known as Bullseye. In the extended director's edition, there's also a lot of extra stuff about trying to figure out who killed this call girl and how it relates back to kingpin, and weirdly, it's not all that interesting or relevant. There's some halfway decent attempts to adapt a few different Daredevil storylines, or at least remind you of the source material. <laughs> The angle's a little off on the side, but I see what you're trying to do there. The first shot of Daredevil himself is right out of the Guardian Devil covers. Though, even as a kid, I was bothered by the origin story omitting the character Stick, only because I saw him in the Spider-Man crossover episode. I remember back then, I just assumed he showed up off-screen at some point, but it really seems like they just ignored that altogether. A lot of this feels wrong, though, because I feel like everyone in this movie is kinda miscast except for Foggy Nelson and Kingpin. Jon Favreau has made an acting career out of being the tired-of-your-bullshit sidekick to superheroes. It's funny that he's gotten to share a scene with both Matt Murdocks. And it's a shame that this movie spends so much time up Bullseye's ass that we don't get enough Michael Clark Duncan screen time as Wilson Fisk. He's got the perfect imposing kingpin figure without ridiculous shoulder pads in his suit and lifts in his shoes. I wanted to know more about this version of the character and how he totally fought Spider-Man 2 one time. But for the length of the director's cut, he still doesn't get enough time to really shine. Which is a damn shame. Ben Affleck has gone on record that he hates this movie and you can see his frustration a little while he's performing in it. 
you just know he wishes it was better because that's the kind of actor and director he is. Talked to me about Linus and how he moved and how he counted money and what his house looked like. And I thought that was the most interesting thing about the movie, frankly. A lot of the other stuff at the movie was, was kind of silly. I don't think he came into the role trying to half-ass it at all, but he just doesn't hit the right marks for Daredevil for me. Plus, his chemistry with Elektra is weirdly flat. How did these two end up together in real life? They're so awkward in this movie. I just don't really buy this romance, and Elektra's whole thing where she's the girl next door daughter of a billionaire, but also just happens to be a ninja, just feels weird. This is a terrible way to introduce her. Colin Farrell is on a different planet from everyone else in this movie. This bullseye feels like he's played by two actors, Colin Farrell and Crack. Dead. He's such a cartoon character, and it feels like he was told to be as over-the-top as possible in a way that's hilarious in, like, an ironic, unintentional way. Like, I just can't take him seriously. He's completely out of his mind. I watched this movie with my friend William, and this single frame of Bullseye is so funny that it killed him right there. He's never been the same. Can anyone print this as a custom head for a Marvel Legends figure? That'd be so f***ing funny. This movie has a really weird obsession with naming extras and side characters after comic book writers and artists, and it comes across more inappropriate than fun. If I was Joe Quesada, I'd be pissed. They named a rapist after him. She asked me if I want to stick around for some fun. It does lead to some good out of context clips, though. Mr. Quesada, for your sake, I hope justice is found here. before justice finds you. Jack Murdoch has to fight John Romita. Hey, you son of a bitch, I'm gonna make you look like how my son draws a character with bruises. One of the major drawbacks for me is that I feel like the film is lacking anything stylistically that it can call its own. Not much really stands out to the point where I can go, oh hey, that reminds me of that Daredevil 2003 movie. The direction just seems to be biting off the stylization of other superhero movies that were recent at the time. It's got suit-up scenes right out of Schumacher's Batman, and it feels like it's lightly stealing iconography from Raimi's Spider-Man, but not really doing much that's identifiable and unique to itself. I guess the only exception to this is probably the radar vision scenes. A lot of people said Morbius kind of looked like this. It's the first and really only time a live-action property has attempted to show us what it's like inside Daredevil's head. The TV show would only do, like, one single shot in its entire run, though I do wonder why is it blue? Ben, fix that in editing. Yeah, look at that, that's more like it. I really can't see why they went with blue over red for any reason other than it's more scary and less whimsical. But that's part of the point. Like, what do you actually see? The world's on fire. Nobody's doing it like Spider-Man TAS. Even Daredevil was on point there. Otherwise, the action is at the very least serviceable for a Daredevil thing. Daredevil's always kind of stretching the bounds of what's possible for a normal human being in combat, but we accept it and enjoy it because he's dressed in a devil costume. Actually, you know what would have helped hide the CGI stunt doubles better around this time period? Full body costumes! I want a costume. Seems like a missed opportunity since you already have one guy in a crazy outfit. Between this and the Ghost Rider movies, the first one even being from the same director, I've noticed a pattern from this time period where superhero movies felt like they could only really stomach having one character in a comic accurate costume at a time, and the rest had to be in street clothes or human forms. Spider-Man being the exception of course because they were completely unashamed to have a silly cackling man in a goblin suit flying around blowing people up. Why did we not learn better lessons from Spider-Man's success for like another 10 years? For all the vibes it took from Spider-Man, they seem to miss a lot of the other important hallmarks that made that so memorable and cool. Bullseye's wardrobe instead consists of just a blue jacket that makes a rattlesnake noise for some reason. And for the love of God, kids, don't make your superhero uniform out of leather. You'll get heat stroke and it doesn't stretch well for your flying roundhouse kicks. Tobey Maguire's suit looked like rubber in some shots, but at its core, it's just foam muscle padding covered by plain old spandex. They just painted it up real good. I feel like I didn't appreciate those movies enough as a kid. I can't imagine where we'd be without them. And again, those movies wouldn't exist without Spider-Man TAS. 
I know a lot of people insist that the director's cut of Daredevil is better, but I feel like it's just... Uh, longer. I think a lot of this makes perfect sense to have cut. Having Ben Urich just walk up to Matt and announce that he's going to out his secret identity in an article was unnecessary. The ending flows better with him just coming to his own decision to kill the story and preserve a secret. The added subplot of the additional lawyer stuff is nice only because it gives Matt and Foggy more time to riff and be buddies, but the actual courtroom scenes aren't that compelling and it adds even more to the pile of scenes where Daredevil is just absolutely terrible with keeping his secret identity a secret. Of which there are just so many to choose from! He basically tells Elektra how his powers work on their first date with the raindrops highlighting her face. His baton he left at a crime scene is also his walking stick. Yeah, that too. Hey, why are you in there? What about the scene where the blind man effortlessly handcuffs the cop to the car? He's been blind since he was a kid. He doesn't know how to use a f***ing gear shift. Then he goes, why hasn't your goddamn heart rate changed? The f***, man? Having a kung fu battle with Elektra in broad daylight in front of all these witnesses, constantly telegraphing to Foggy that he can recognize when an attractive woman has entered the room, literally dunking on Foggy. Maybe that last one was just because he was a really good lawyer. The other biggest struggle with the movie is just not really knowing how to write any good drama. The impetus of Matt's entire moral arc in the movie is this frightened child that was a random bystander for him savagely beating up a criminal. And without any subtlety, he just starts chanting, I'm not the bad guy, kid. I'm not the bad guy. 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 I'm not the bad guy! This whole scene could have worked if he just took out the clunky dialogue and then like, the really silly scene of him s brooding on a rooftop and just saying what he's feeling. Have him, like, notice the kid, then wordlessly back off from the guy and sneak away, and then smash cut to him stashing the costume back at his apartment like, damn, that got out of hand. Something a little bit more show, don't tell, you know? Or even better yet, you could have Matt Murdock scare himself by beating on a guy too much and having a crisis over whether he's trying to enforce street justice or he's just enjoying the catharsis of violence to get over how many problems he's had in life. And he'll wonder if he's going to have to take a life to stop the city from devolving into further chaos. <laughs> oh yeah. He also like, barely says anything in the church scenes to the point that I'm like not even sure why they're there. This conflict is handled in such an obvious and bland way that the payoff of sparing Wilson Fisk at the end doesn't have nearly enough weight to it. Every emotional beat with Elektra is ruined by playing an Evanescence song and an example of one of the most inappropriate needle drops in a superhero adaptation until Sweatpants and Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. Hashtag my day wearing your girl, my day care and I'm born rich, life ain't fair. I really wish to God they hadn't thrown these in here because now these songs just make me laugh every time I hear them. Electra thinking Daredevil was the one who killed her father was contrived because it's just resolved way too quickly and it feels like it only serves as an excuse for a pointless extra fight scene between them. And lastly, Matt and Kingpin have like, nothing to do with each other and it sucks. Daredevil barely knows Kingpin exists throughout the majority of the movie. He can't. Kingpin's gotta be footing the bill. And when his connections to him become apparent, it's way too late in the movie so we don't get to build any kind of rivalry. They share two scenes together. He doesn't learn Wilson Fisk is Kingpin until Bullseye just flat out tells him. Like an idiot. And then Daredevil's like, oh yeah, I saw that guy at a party one time. Finding out Fisk was the one who killed his dad happens at the very last minute as an attempt to give the character more of a dramatic reason for their fight other than opposing ideologies. But it doesn't really feel like it matters or changes much. They were trying to do like a, I'm gonna kill MJ Spider-Man moment where he's like, oh, hey. I'm motivated to kick your ass now. Oh, you know what? It's like trying to do the moment where you find out Joker shot Batman's parents in the 89 movie, but they don't emphasize it nearly as much, and in that one, Batman and Joker spent a lot of time butting heads prior to that reveal. I also don't really think it was necessary if they were going to barely do anything with it. Anyone could have killed Jack Murdock, and it still would have had the same effect on Daredevil's life in the movie thus far. It didn't have to also conveniently be the main bad guy. The TV show didn't do that, and it did a much better job of developing the hatred between these two guys who had never met before season one. On the other hand, the Spider-Man episode had it so Matt Murdock was fully aware for years that young Wilson Fisk killed his dad, and spent ages building a case publicly and privately to take the Kingpin down. 
One or the other, this middle road thing offers no real reason to get invested. I'm sure this is some sacred childhood movie to someone out there, but I promise you, I'm the same age, I grew up with it too, it's not really that good, champ. And if you think I'm an asshole for saying it's bad and criticizing it, then you have to say the same to Ben Affleck. This movie's messy, packed to the gills with way too much going on all at once, and not sure what tone it wants to go for. It doesn't have that camp and earnestness of Spider-Man, it doesn't have the staunch reality of X-Men, and it doesn't have the deliberate, crushing sadness of the Hulk. It's trying to do all of that at once and can't succeed with any of them. The director's cut is two hours long and it spends a lot of time dragging ass on stuff that they were right to cut for the standard version. It's not egregiously bad like some superhero stuff from around this time, but I see why this one isn't fondly remembered. Even the people who worked on it didn't have nice things to say about it. Though the silver lining is that all of these actors later got to be in much better comic book movies. Well, except Michael Clark Duncan, he was in Green Lantern. Oh, and Jennifer Garner! You know, I was actually wondering why I've never heard anyone talk about this movie before online. I wasn't expecting it to be some kind of hidden gem, but I was expecting there to be something to make it worth bringing up in conversation. But I get it now. This movie isn't hilariously bad, but it's also not good. It's just boring. It's so slow and bland. It's just a big old nothing sandwich of a movie. I just finished it a few minutes ago as of writing this script, and I, I feel like I'm already forgetting what happened in it. It's noteworthy in the lineage of Marvel movies because this and Daredevil are the first ever examples of two unrelated Marvel projects sharing continuity. This is the first Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's depressing. So even though Stick and The Chaste and The Hand and all that Frank Miller jazz was left out of Daredevil, it's present here, and that bothers me to no end. Stick just never met Daredevil, and Matt Murdock trained himself to fight by jumping on rooftops all day long? Whatever. Instead of just learning even more martial arts, Elektra also learns how to have Final Destination premonitions of her own death, and how to revive people from the dead like they did to her. But Elektra is too much of a rebel and leaves the chase to go be an assassin for hire instead of just being like a doctor and cashing in on that Miyagi magic technique she's got. The plot starts to actually happen when she's hired to Moida, the guy who wrote the Ultimates, and his daughter, who has some secret for why the Hand wants to take her out. With just a short amount of time, Elektra bonds with the young girl with the map to dry land tattooed on her back that's immune to the Cordyceps virus, and also the son of Mephisto, who will one day lead the future resistance against the machines. Then she decides to not kill them and instead will protect them from a gaggle of boring assassins working for... Shang Tsung. They even have the same magic tattoos as Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Uh, apparently members of the Hand turn into green smoke and disappear when they die because they'd run out of internal memory rendering all the ragdolls so they need to despawn. Also, this character is supposed to be Typhoid Mary from the comics, I guess? She's an evil slag and deserves to get thrown out a window like 80 more times for what she did to Deadpool. She's also in Iron Fist Season 2, which nobody watched. Get her, Electra! <laughs> what the f I'd buy that side throw if Spider-Man did it, but just about any other character in the Marvel Universe, and I'm calling bullshit. I would raise an eyebrow if even Bullseye made that throw. If I seem a little bit all over the place with this one, it's because I'm trying my absolute damnedest to figure out what to even say about this movie. This is like watching paint dry. I guess if there's anything I can commend it for, it's that it subverted the usual special child trope by having the twist be that Abby is actually an ultra martial arts super prodigy that can kick ass too. The Hand wants her just because, with a little bit of mind control, she could be their best assassin ever. I also liked finding out that Stick was the one who hired Elektra to go after these two in the first place because he knew she was a good person deep down and would end up protecting them instead. There's some neat moments in here character-wise, it's just that they're all compacted into relatively the same five minute window, while the entire movie preceding it and after it are very dull. There's also nothing about the action that's really unique or memorable or really even that cool. 
I think Electra ran on a tree that a guy cut down with his superpowers, and then the tree just fell on him. But I, I don't know why she was running on it, because she wasn't really influencing the direction of the tree. So he just made a mistake and squished himself, and she was like, trying to make it look like it was her idea. Thank God for the Netflix show once again doing a more comic accurate Electra and Stick. I may not have totally loved Daredevil Season 2 because of its weird pacing and distracting from Punisher, but after seeing this, I have more appreciation for what they did with the characters and all the lore with the hand and Elektra herself. The Jennifer Garner Elektra feels like a movie made on autopilot by a ton of people who didn't know or care that much about the source material. Just like, making a movie for the sake of it. However, if this movie was starring a bumbling male sitcom actor in the lead, had more no, not better, just more special effects. Uh, a cameo from Wong and Black Widow, and you know what, throwing a giant blue laser in the sky in the last fight scene? And I think people would say that's one of the best Marvel movies yet. I always get mad at YouTube for not putting my videos in the subscription box because people will comment, finally, Xavier uploads again after all these years, not knowing three other videos came out within the last month already. So, maybe that stupid bell icon thing will help you remember I exist? If you want other ways to support the channel, you can always go hit up that Patreon for early videos and exclusive stuff because it's just a dollar. I'm not kidding, it's only one dollar. Isn't that cool? If everyone who watched this video donated one dollar a month, I'd be able to afford a house for myself, so that would be, that would be really cool. You can also check out our merch on TeePublic, or just buy some of my random stuff on eBay. I have a pretty substantial collection of old toys that are still in the box in perfect condition, so go take a look in case you find something you like. And lastly, since this is a YouTube video and you probably play Fortnite, drop my creator code XavierGM next time you buy a silly dance or a cool character skin. It really helps me out. Uh, see you next time!